I'm going to start just by sharing a story of two ladies that I met in Kenya that lived in neighboring villages and they shared their lives together. And over a period of time, um, they stopped seeing each other, literally. And that's because both of them had started to lose their vision until eventually they both became blind from a condition known as cataract, which is completely treatable. This was the moment that they were in one of our clinics and we were calling people's names to come onto the bus to take them to hospital. It was the first moment, having been sat next to each other for over an hour, that they realised they were sat together. And the lady here closest to me grabbed hold of her friend and wouldn't let go of her all the way through to the three-hour journey into the hospital. There are two of 39 million people globally who suffer with blindness. And four in every five people who are blind are blind from conditions that we already have cures for or know how to prevent. And it's not just the blind person who's affected, it's their entire community. This is one of our midweek clinics in Kenya. And if you look carefully, there are two people here carrying white sticks, both accompanied by young children. These are children who should ideally be in school, fulfilling their education potential. But what happens is they become the eyes for, the, for their parents or grandparents and miss out on that chance. And if you look at where visual loss is distributed in the world, it's primarily in low-income countries. Whereas if you look at where ophthalmologists are, it's in complete inverse proportion to that. And nowhere is that disparity greater than in sub-Saharan Africa, where the gap between need and provision is, is very extreme. And just to give you some context around that, for every one ophthalmologist in Kenya, there are 100 here in the UK. 50% of those surgeons are based in Nairobi, which serves 8% of the population. So as you go out to the more peripheral areas, the access to eye specialists are very, very few. And I've been working with people who are managing single-handedly a population of 2 to 3 million people. It was for these reasons and many others that in 2012, my wife and I and our young son moved out to Kenya. We were there primarily to run a large trial. The trial known as the Nakuru Eye Disease Cohort Study was designed to try and work out why were people going blind, how many new people were going blind and what the causes were, and could we work out what the risk factors were and provide evidence that the government could use to plan their eye health services. To do this was extremely challenging because the quality of the data had to be so high for it to be meaningful. It required us to set up a hundred different eye clinics across a large region. We'd often use whatever building we could get hold of, so a local hospital or a primary school, or the village chief's hut. And often the places that we had to go to, although often beautiful, were very difficult to reach. When there was road access, this was very often the case. But when we did get there, we were using top-of-the-range equipment, the kind of kit you'd expect to see in an eye hospital here, which allowed us to do really high-quality assessments. But we rarely had power supply to, to run the kit. So we'd either be inverting the battery on our bus or running things from the petrol power generator. We'd provide very detailed front and back of the eye examinations, including retinal photographs, which were sent to Moorfields Eye Hospital to be independently graded. And lots of data was collected on workbooks for every single one of our 5,000 participants in the study. This data would then go back to our office team, who would have boxes of paper to put into a database. What we would continually see was in the places where road access was poor, there was minimal infrastructure, there would be the greatest queues of patients waiting to see us. This is one of our clinics where there were 250 patients waiting to see us when we got there. People would often describe that they'd never seen an eye specialist before, some had never seen medical personnel before. There was one particular occasion at this uh, clinic, very similar to this, where I, I needed to use the facilities and I'd try my best to hold on if I could. A pit latrine, so this was a place where there was no running water, there was no electricity, um, and there was no road access. But as I went to open the door, somebody was inside chatting on their mobile phone. <laughs> Obviously, I was really concerned about the hygiene implications of this, but the thing that really struck me was, I mean, a place with very little infrastructure, but there's very good mobile phone connectivity. Across sub-Saharan Africa, 80% of people now have access to a mobile device, whereas only 50% have access to clean running water and sanitation services. And despite this being a, a travesty, it's actually an opportunity for us to harness mobile connectivity in a new way. Mobile penetration has massively increased over the last decade. As our population globally has increased to 7 billion, we've got to a point of near ubiquity where almost everyone has access to a device. In this time period as well, we've seen a huge transition in terms of computing power. This was a five megabyte hard drive in 1968. At the same time we've seen since mobile phones were created, things have evolved rapidly. In the last 12 years, we've massively grown in terms of what's possible in terms of mobile phones and smartphones in particular. So the first iPhone in 2007, which cost over $500, 
is not as powerful as the newest Android device that has just been released that costs less than $10. So with some colleagues, I downloaded every single app that was available to do with eye care or had anything remotely related to eyes. There was about three or 400 of them at the time. And as I started to sift through them, test them, what I realized is all of the ones we looked at, only one had any validation data that suggested this could actually be used as a medical test. So we summarized this in a paper called iPhones for Eye Surgeons with a kind of call to action that you need to have something that's valid. It's not good enough just to release an application and say that it does a job. So this is when we started to work together to develop something called PEAK, the Portable Eye Examination Kit. The idea was to take every piece of expensive medical equipment that we had running in this clinic and to change it to something that was more accessible and mobile. Being an eye doctor and a tech geek and interested in technology but not a developer, I looked to see if there was anyone out there who was keen on doing Android development and would be willing to come and work in Kenya um, and was happy to not be paid. So obviously floods of applications came in. <laughs> But actually one person that did respond was Stuart Jordan who said, yeah, I'll come out and help for a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks turned into nine months and we've been co-founders now and working together for over three years on, on this. We looked to try and transform each of these tests and the first one was our vision test. Just so critical in determining whether someone can actually see or not and the level to which they can see. The idea was to replace the large chart with symbols that were not dependent on language. What we didn't want to measure was literacy, but your ability to see. As the E changes size and shape, the patient points in the direction they see it. The examiner doesn't need to know what's on the phone screen, they just swipe in response to the patient. If the patient says they can't see, we shake the phone in response to say they couldn't see, and it very quickly tells us the, the answer. What I did realize from looking at the data as we were getting this and comparing it to gold standard data was about two-thirds were really accurate, but about one-third was just all over the place, and it didn't really make sense. So we started tapping into the lux meter on the phone. Now the lux meter for most devices is primarily there to change your screen brightness. But we looked at that and started measuring that every time we took a vision measurement. For those that were all over the place, they would have very high lux readings. So these were people who were having their vision tested out in the sun, screen reflections were causing problems. And so what I said to the team is, you need to make sure you test everyone indoors. And they said, yes, Dr. Andrew, we'll do that. The results came back and they were exactly the same. So I then went out to the field with them to watch what was going on. And the reason they were not able to always test indoors is this was a three meter vision test and the majority of people's homes would not accommodate a three meter vision test. So rather than trying to change the environment to fit the test, we changed the test to fit the environment and turned it into a two meter vision test. At which point we started to get really good results. And then Stu and I started bouncing ideas in terms of how could we always ensure that that was a two meter measure because getting the distance was critical. So we started using things like the front-facing camera to look at how pupil difference changed, looking at how face shape changed, looking at trying to do echo bounce, all sorts of very smart and intelligent things. But ultimately, we found a piece of string worked better than <laughs> all of them. We had lots of different people using the test, from eye nurses to local people with no healthcare training. And it was key to observe behavior in the field as it was being done. Here's an example of a mother having her vision tested and her daughter telling her the answers. So as helpful as that is, it's not giving us the results that we want. So a lot of education had to go around performing the test. Another thing that we realized is how you articulate the result of that test, because people who have a test want to know what it means and what the result was. So telling someone that they have 618 vision or 2060 vision doesn't really mean anything. So we built a simulator that would show them and show their carers what it meant to have that level of vision. So one half of the screen would show them the visual world of the person just tested, and the other side, the normal vision. Now, going back to the previous point of things not being valid, we made sure that we validated this. So in over 200 patients, they were examined on peak twice, both at home and in a clinic. They also had a standard Snellen chart, which is the typical thing you'll have in most opticians or clinics. And they also had this gold standard test done. And what we wanted to show was it was accurate, as accurate as the gold standard, that it was repeatable. So if I test you today and tomorrow, I'll get the same result. And that it was fast, because if it's fast, it's more likely to be adopted and used. And we were able to show that all of those things were true and we published that data earlier this year. Having a test that measures vision is, is great, but if that doesn't result in a person who's found to have low vision turning up and getting treatment, we still haven't closed the gap. So that was only the beginning. So we started working with a brilliant doctor called Dr. Rono, who works in a region of Kenya. He, he was one of these people I described looking after a population of two to three million people. And we said, can we try and find children in schools who are visually impaired? Now, the prevalence of visual impairment schools is about 4 or 5%. So in a classroom of 50, about two people might have a sight problem. 
But what that also means is 48 won't. So sending an eye nurse from the hospital, which was the current screening program, to examine all of these kids was a very poor utility of their time, especially when they're in a context where if they're not in the hospital, there's no one there to replace them and, and, and fill the gap. So we started to train teachers to measure vision in schools, and we used all those features that I described, such as the simulator. And we'd often get feedback from the teacher saying, I had no idea the child couldn't see. I just thought they weren't paying attention. We would then create a photograph based on that child's vision, which would become a referral note. The reason we did it as a photograph is from observations in Kenya, people really valued a photo far more than a piece of paper. And to give them visual information in a visual way was far more valuable to them and more likely to create a change in behaviour. And as an example, we had parents complaining to their child when they were sent home having got 2014 in their vision exam and being told, well, that's not very good to only get 50%, you need to try harder next time. <laughs> so this really helped articulate the problem. So those that passed, they were very quickly moved on to the next child. But if they failed, they'd be asked to write in their parent's name. It would be affiliated to the school's head teacher, uh, the local language of the parent, and their phone number. As soon as they did that, the hospital would be notified in real time of any child by any school that had failed the test. The parent would then receive a personalised SMS explaining that their child had been examined on this day in the school and found to have a problem. So that day, the parent had received the message in two ways, both from the photograph and from this text message. The head teacher would receive a list of children in their school that had failed the test with a view to trying to motivate them to go ahead and do something. And what we were able to do is screen 20,000 children in, by 25 teachers, and that was done in less than two weeks. Uh, thanks to some recent funding from Seeing is Believing, we're now starting to scale that program. We did that as a randomised controlled trial, and we were able to show a, a three times increase in adherence to treatment. And thanks to this funding, we're now going to extend that to 400 schools across Kenya, so around 300,000 children, and a similar program in India, with a view that we spread this much further as things go on. Another challenge when it comes to eye care is to determine vision loss is one thing, but the cause is a, a different challenge altogether. And really, you need to be able to visualize the eye in a lot of the cases to understand why someone has lost vision. So here you can see the back of somebody's eye. That glowing thing on the far side is a, the optic nerve, a direct extension of the brain. You can see blood vessels. And there's so much information that you can pick up by looking at someone's retina, not just their eye health, but their general health. But the traditional methods of looking at the eye tend to be a little awkward or intimate. The alternative is to have one of these stunning desktop retinal cameras which provide beautiful photographs but as you can see from our problems in Kenya, they require infrastructure, they require trained personnel to operate. So prior to Kenya, I set out on a journey trying to develop technology that would overcome this issue. And the first thing was something um, which I called smartphone fundoscopy, which was to change a method that we used in ophthalmology to look inside the eye. And this required holding a lens in front of the patient's eye with the phone on and the flash on and aligning them so that you'd get a view of the retina. It was a good method, but it required someone who knew how to hold the lens. So there was quite a few moving parts and it was it was not something that the, the non-eye doctor was going to be able to do. So then started to try and make something else, and this was using a wide-field ophthalmoscope and retrofitting it to the best smartphone that was around at the time in terms of camera capabilities, which was the Nokia N8. When I first got this working, it took me about three months to engineer all the parts. I was delighted with the views I was getting. I thought, well, I'll finally crack something, and, and my wife was saying, you know, this is, this is going to be brilliant in paediatrics and, and really helpful. Um, so I was feeling pretty smug and then took it out to Kenya and realised in less than 20 minutes that it was just not going to work. The learning curve was too steep. It was all dependent on your ability to use an ophthalmoscope. And really what we needed was if you could take a picture on a smartphone, you should be able to take a picture of somebody's eye. At this time, 3D printing was emerging as something that was becoming more popular. I'd done a talk up in Scotland in 2012 where I met a guy called Mario Giardini, who can only be described as a wizard. Um, he'd just 3D printed his own 3D printer. <laughs> and he said, look, I can help you. Um, so he took the design that I'd made, he scanned it and printed it, and basically replicated it in less than 24 hours. But we then set about trying to create something completely different. And, and this was the first prototype of a, of a new device which would be much smaller, much lower cost, and that could fit onto the phone directly um, without needing a lot of skill to, to operate and take an image of the eye. So what we started then doing was putting this in the hands of both eye-trained nurses and clinical officers in Kenya and non-eye-trained people, so school leavers, to see what could they do when they were doing it. And what we were able to show in the study was that our images were very comparable to that of a desktop camera at marginal cost. And when we compared a school leaver taking images using peak retina to a trained technician using a desktop camera, 
and all of the images independently graded at more fields, our results were entirely comparable. So we now thought we have a device that is potentially going to be of value to lots of different people. We want to bring this to market. The problem was the production pipeline was going to cost us at least £120,000, which we didn't have. We did have some prize money, about £50,000, which we could put towards this, but we were left in a position where we needed to raise another 70000 And we had to make a call at that point. Do we take on investors and, and really try and get it out that way? Or do we just try and really focus down on the social purpose of what we're trying to do to make sure it goes to the markets that are the priority to us? Um, and together we thought crowdfunding might be a solution to this. So we went on to raise £130,000, so we um, exceeded our target and we're now hoping by early next year to be releasing Peak Retina on, onto the market. What initially required £100,000 worth of kit and 15 people to operate and do the assessments that we needed, we're moving towards having a single community healthcare worker on a bike using a smartphone, the whole thing costing a hundredth of the original cost. We've overcome the issues of power supply by having solar-powered rucksacks which charge a backup battery, and it means that we go to the homes of people rather than waiting for them never to come. When there's good connectivity, it's possible to connect directly with people anywhere in the world to share data and understand what the problem is. And by also using geotagging, we're able to identify why, where these patients are. In a lot of the settings we went, address history or contact information is very difficult. So here we're building something where you can search by any given parameter. So here people who are blind from cataract are with the red pins. They're now contactable and traceable. And in the same way we used the, the SMS service in the school study, we're able to now take out into an outreach setting. And one of the things that we learned that was key was sending a, a text message to someone that can't see is not necessarily very helpful. So it's important to have a key contact person who brings together those people in the community and, and helps with the logistics. Now that there's this new technology that might create lots more image data, who's going to be interpreting it? Is this going to cause another burden further up the health system tree? And that's when I turned to the obvious tangent of astrophysics. I started collaborating with a group called the Zooniverse, which is the biggest citizen science platform in the world. And the founder said it was based on the fact that five million hours per day are spent playing Angry Birds. So people have spare time. And if you give them something interesting to do, they'll do it. And he did this to overcome a major hurdle for his PhD project where he created Galaxy Zoo, which in the end up getting over 57 million classifications done by the lay public by taking this decision tree to analyse images of outer space and come up with a classification for them. I spoke to him and said, could we do this for retinas because we have that same problem? Um, and so we've now got a prototype of this built that we're testing where we ask anyone to go on, onto this site and mark features. They don't need to know anything about eye health or eye disease. We give them very specific tasks to do, and we can have multiple people looking at the same image, and we can pool that data and aggregate it to turn it into a clinical diagnosis. And we're working with both Moorfields and the National Eye Institute at the moment to grade 100,000 images to see if we can get it to be comparable to an expert looking at this. We're calling this platform Field of Vision, and we hope this is something that people will be able to integrate into the future. With great gratitude to the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust, who've really helped us move a lot of what we're doing forward, we now have active research trials or early programmes in eight different countries. But all of these things come back down to the individual as to why we do it. You remember those two ladies at the beginning of the story? Well, this was the result for them. Yeah.